Welcome to the Awe and Wonder podcast, AAC and AT. We're in C- Series 5, talking about vision. I'm Sarah Kinsella. And I'm Brenda Del Monte. And today we're joined by Marcy Ravelli. And Marcy is a speech-language pathologist who specializes in augmentative alternative communication, AAC. She's worked in public and private schools, as well as hospitals, clinics, and in private practice in Boston and Seattle. Um, Marcy is an owner and director of Augmentative Alternative Communication Services, and she also currently runs the AAC program at Seattle Children's Hospital. She's presented regionally and nationally with a special interest in all things AAC, curriculum modifications, and inclusion for children with AAC needs. And Marcy, you've been at the Children's Hospital here in Seattle for a long time and um, have seen so many students um, with all different AAC systems and needs. Um, and so we're so excited to, to hear from you today. Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. It's, um, it's a delight and I'm so grateful for the invitation. Great, thank you. So um, today we're talking about um, low vision and vision and how that relates to AAC and AT. Um, what's your experience with AAC and low vision? Either of those. Vision. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I love that. Um, kind of like, how did I dive in deep to it, right? Yeah. You get here. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, I like sharing that my first job outside of grad school was uh, at a school called the Boston College Campus School, and it was located on the campus of Boston College in Massachusetts. Uh, And at the time, this school served children from the surrounding communities who couldn't be served in their local school district. So the school would contract to have kids come in. Um, They had many uh, non-speaking kids and a lot of kids with vision differences. And so I was immediately right in that in that fellowship year, like just immersed in augmentative alternative communication and vision mm-hmm. um, and of course like grad school right like who grad school doesn't prepare you for, for either thing actually for AAC or vision or vision right, um, <laughs> right. let yeah. alone combining them <laughs> yeah so there was this one teacher who started at the same time that I did and she had taught at Perkins School for the Blinds deaf blind program and so it was really a combination of like this teacher's expertise and the population that started my journey. Um, What a gift. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and way back when, when there wasn't really a lot of technology, um, it was, it was like tactile sign language or tangible symbols. Right. Um, So yeah, that was my entry point. Wow. Right away. Oh, Um, wow. What a, great experience you had and maybe only in hindsight do you realize how precious that really was because you I mean you know when you're in the moment you're like cool now in hindsight you're like oh gosh where would I even be without the foundation you know yeah I think that's so true and my there was another SLP there who um who was also really instrumental at um like we used to put um tangible symbols on an intro talker um, so that's an old, 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 old PRC device, hmm. uh, right? Uh, and yes, oh, that's okay. something right that never comes up unless you know about it. Um, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I oh. think that wasn't that nineties. Yeah, in the early nineties. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're we're dating ourselves now. <laughs> yes. What is your current job look like as far as um, working with students who have vision differences. Sure. Yeah. Um, I work at Seattle Children's Hospital. I've been at Children's for over 20 years. And treatment. Um, I uh, I was just sharing with you off, off camera that um, I was solo for a really long time and now there's two yeah. of us. Um, and we do about 300 AAC evaluations a year. But, you know, we do like three AAC evaluations a week. Um, and um, I think roughly about 10 years ago, I took, I went down to the bridge school conference mm-hmm. um, and little did I know that SCTC has sponsors, um, oh, yeah, uh, the, what, 
AAC by the Bay conference at the Bridge School. And then we sponsor like the remote um, hosting of that conference, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. I remember, um, I think, what, have you been there more than once? Because I remember when you were down there. I went in person once and then mm-hmm. I went to one of your host sites. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But that, that was really my entry point back into vision um, mm. and specifically uh, cortical cerebral vision impairment. Mm-hmm. Um, and that conference rocked my world um, mm. because it explains so much about the population of kids that come into children's that were being referred for AAC. Um, so it was really my starting point and kind of my deep dive back into the world of vision. Mm-hmm. I'm glad you brought up that conference. I don't think we've talked about that yet. And it is such a gem. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I'm also glad that you called it cortical cerebral visual impairment <laughs> because it almost like it needs a CCVI only because we're, we're not, we're not all sh- agreeing on what the C should be here. Do you want to speak to that for a minute? You know, I, I wish I could, right. But so in the, in the newer literature, you see mm-hmm. CCVI, um, mm-hmm. but I think the habit is CBI. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do know, just like you stated, that there's some discussion around what is the most appropriate thing to call it. Right. Yeah. We've talked about that with other guests, kind of the shift in vocabulary around that. Mm-hmm. Marcy, what have you noticed is important to consider when you're working with students who have low vision and use AAC or when you're evaluating students? When I am evaluating AAC for students with low vision, you know, I think the first place I start with is to get a super clear medical history. Uh, And I'm lucky because I work in a hospital and I have access to the child's medical records. Um, So I can really comb to see what their medical history is, Mm. uh, what their diagnoses are, and then if they've been seen by an ophthalmologist. Um, and you know, uh, maybe you've spoken about this to some of your other guests, like there's, there's more than just being nearsighted or farsighted, um, or the student wears glasses. Um, sometimes that's all you get from a ophthalmology appointment. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I'm combing for even before the evaluation is, um, I want to know what the eyes are doing. I want to know how the child sees. Um, And then if I have that information or not, um, I do reach out to school districts and I ask um, to speak with the teacher of the vision impaired or the TBI. um, Because to me, um, these folks have become my lifeline in really trying to figure out what's going on with the vision. And, 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 right? If you're doing a, if you're in the school district and you're doing your three year reevaluation, right? Um, you want the TBI to go first because yeah. then you, uh, they can give you information like um, if they do a functional vision assessment, what is their primary, secondary, and tertiary um, learning channels? Like, are they, are, is the child more auditory or visual or more tactile? Um, and then if the student has a CVI, um, I always ask, oh, 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 did, did they do the CVI range? Mm-hmm. Uh, where are they? What's their score? Give mm-hmm. me more information. Mm-hmm. So that's where I start for assessments with AAC and vision. Um, often you don't have access to a TVI and you don't have mm-hmm. access to the whole background and the medical records. And so my thinking about evaluating kids with vision differences is um, really just being a good observer, right? Mm -hmm. Really, really watching what the child is doing in the presence of visual, auditory, or tactile information. And then like mm, putting two together, right? So if you pull, I I came with visuals, right? So if you Mm -hmm. hold up, You hold up this. Oh, yeah. Like a little um, foam basketball, like the size of a mini orange. 
Yeah. Um, and then you're watching how the how the student looks at it. Um, and then if you start talking to them, do they look away? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, which maybe people wouldn't think about that because, you know, we as speech pathologists talk all the time. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Or if you hold it close enough, do they reach for it? And when they reach for it, do they look away? Right. And right. so really being a good observer of what the child is doing with their vision. Um, I think that's kind of the second um, piece of advice. Uh, if you don't have um, a lot of good records to start with. Right. You can see the eyes like shake when they have to converge. You can see one eye drift off like that nystagmus or, or, or strabismus, right? Which is often documented. But what you're talking about is like, I can't, I can't listen and see at the same, I do, you know, those, those compete for me. So I'm going to, I'm going to let one go, sense go. Right. So I'm going, and then, um, so I, if I reach, I'm not going to look because that my motor planning takes all of my information, takes all of my effort, right? And my vision isn't helping me out with that. It's so good to think about all those different pieces. And even, you know, sometimes they, I see some kids that are really, really young. I mean, I see some birth to three kids and, and they'll, the, the students, the parents have say, I say the vision is tearing and normal. Yeah. Yeah. The vision's yeah. tearing. Okay. And then they say, and then I say, what do they like to play with? Well, they're only really interested in, right? And sometimes it's like textures that feel like foil and make noises. And it's like, okay, so that suggests to me that that's that there's that they're they needing input more than just their vision for that toy, right? Or they only like music, right? A lot, all kids like music, I think, that are hearing, but still, um, it's it's a clue. Or they only like light up toys, and they bring it right up to their eyeballs, and you're like, okay. So, I mean, even if there's no acuity problems here, something's going on with the vision just by their toy preference even, right? I um, I was following the bridge school. I went and did the AAC and CVI course at Perkins School for the Blind, um, okay. which is also just a fantastic um, a bunch of resources and e-learning classes over at Perkins. Mm -hmm. um, and also learned about the CVI range, took a course through that. Um, and I think, Brenda, what you're speaking to is um, uh, I can ask questions as if I'm diving into the range um, because I have the knowledge of uh, right. the CVI range. Um, I made a decision in that I don't give the range because I'm not a teacher of the vision impaired. Yeah. But all of that, all of that detailed information about um, do they have a color preference? Can mm -hmm. they coordinate their eyes with their hands? Um, are they delayed in finding something? Do mm -hmm. they need um, do they need movement? There's a slinky on my mm -hmm. screen in yeah. order for them to see it. Um, like all of those questions, you can That's ask cool. families and. Maybe they think that vision is just fine, but through how they answer those questions, yeah. that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Um, right? I think maybe we should have you go see a, yeah. a vision specialist. Yeah. And I'm not a vision expert and I'm not diagnosing a de deficit, but I am telling you that we might want more information about this, right? As an SLP. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And normally in AAC, uh, if I do see a, a cortical cerebral vision impairment, um, it would be in what's called phase one or phase two, kind of the the, the earlier stages of vision development. But mm -hmm. last week, um, I, I think there's a kid in phase three. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's where your vision is kind of approaching more normal for right. CBI. Um, but there was something on a very detailed AAC screen that he interacted with differently right? right. Um, so it's neat to be aware of the CVI range in order to then look at AAC with, with that, through that lens. What's challenging about C visual impairments in AAC is that the SLP in you wants to do more language. The more language, the better. The, robot, the more robust, the better. And that is a true statement. But if we tax the visual system and they can only use that AAC system for 10 minutes a day because they're visually overloaded and they hate the thing, 
then you're stuck. And I think that's, there's always this kind of t- push and pull, you know, on, I want this to be robust, but if we're doing, um, but how much is going to be too much, even if they're scanning, right? I want, I want this to be robust, but how much is too much auditory scanning? Like scanning is hard. Um, you know, and even if there some, I mean, people with low vision can still do AAC. Sometimes that's still their relative strength. Right. Um, but it's like, but if we, get, if we have two choices, I, you know, so how, how, where, how are you making those decisions about um, what can their vision handle? And, and yet they need more language than that. Yeah, I love that. That's a, such a great question. And you're kind of speaking to, I think, some myths related to yes. AAC and vision. Led um, you right there. Tell us, yeah. tell us, what are the myths? Yeah. Well, you know, because AAC is full of myths. Um, yes. But then thinking about how vision ties in, I can see kind of two myths. Um mm-hmm. So, uh, so I'll share a story, right? <laughs> right yes, please, we um, love stories. Yeah, so I, I think one of the most startling, but actually really cool things is that when you're just observing a child and, and how they see, sometimes you draw a conclusion like, oh, they can't use their vision to access an AAC system. Like, and then you look at the record and you say, oh gosh, they have several visual diagnoses. They have mm-hmm. uh, nystagmus and they have optic atrophy and, and amblyopia, right? And so forth right. and so on. And when you watch their eyes, they just don't appear to be seeing objects or seeing picture symbols um, or they like can't sustain their gaze for long enough that you can tell what they're looking at. But then, in an evaluation, um, I'm, I'm just so lucky and grateful and privileged to have three different eye gaze systems um, in my clinic. Mm-hmm. Um, I might try an eye gaze camera. And so sometimes mm-hmm. the camera just doesn't pick up the eyes. Exactly. Um, but sometimes it does. And sometimes the cameras can weed through the nystagmus or the other visual differences. And then the child can show us that they can actually see the image on the screen yeah. um, and then I think um, in the case of a child with CVI we learn how to c- control the environment right how to present objects specific objects like objects of one color like an orange ball that I'm holding up or objects of many colors like my colored slinky that I'm holding up mm-hmm. um, or like you said, a shiny reflective coating, um, or you might try picture symbols and, but you've changed the symbol for it to be more simple. Mm-hmm. And then, wow, now the child can actually see what's in front of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, this happened to me with a 16 year old last week where I had been following this child for I would say maybe eight years, um, and he had um, a cerebral palsy and a, a, a epilepsy and heavy medication, and he came into the evaluation sleeping. Mm-hmm, right. And about two years ago, he um, came in with um, more alert, um, less seizures, and now he's using some switches and mm-hmm. not really seeing. And then he came in last week. And I held up, um, I held up a slinky and we were just quiet and my slinky is bouncing. Um, and he looked at the slinky and he followed it all the way. He followed it to each side. Mm-hmm. He followed it up. He followed it down. The mom started crying. Mm-hmm. Um, right. Uh, so, um, I think the myths, there's a couple of myths that are embedded yeah. in there, right? One right. is, um, the myth that I would dispel is that just because a child has a vision difference doesn't exclude them from using AAC, right? Uh, either by accommodating their to their vision difference, or you know, creating an AAC system in line with maybe like auditory scanning, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So that's one myth. But then the other myth is um, just because a child has vision difference doesn't mean they can't use their vision right? for AAC. Mm-hmm. Um, so for sure. 
all kids, you know, kind of in that description, you know, with who are non-speaking or, or difficulty in communicating can have access to AAC. And then now with our technology and with our range of tools and systems, right, we can really figure out, well, can they use their vision? Sometimes we'll talk to families and they'll be like, oh, we tried, we tried eye gaze and it didn't work. And then you kind of go back up and go, okay, but every IGA system has a different camera. And if I hadn't, if I didn't have the privilege that you have as well, where I like and literally do back to back to back, different devices, different cameras, and, and no eyes registered, no eyes registered, eyes registered, right? And it did, doesn't matter what the language system is, right? La access trumps language, right? So this is the one they can access. We can make this language system work <laughs> usually. But it's like, it's so, it's interesting how different the cameras are. And it's not like, and the Toby's always the best one or and smart box and accent and whatever. It's not like, oh, there's always one camera that's the best. No, it's these eyes are working with this camera. Let's see. Let's see what happens when we introduce language. Cause you know, there's games on there, right? There's, there's ways to assess the, the eyes a little bit without the demands of the cognitive demands of language. And then you add the language and see what happens. And, you know, I always come back to that too, when people say, well, they don't have vision, so I'm not referring them for AAC. That is a huge myth that we, that for somehow we blocked, we forgot that blind people can communicate using AAC. And that means that if even low vision also has that op same option. Yeah, yeah. And furthermore, AAC isn't just devices, right? Mm, because, right. Right. So so we've lost sight of the fact that there is tactile sign language. Yeah. And there is um, kind of partner-assisted auditory scanning. Right. Alternative mm -hmm. communication. Yeah, these are all AAC. Um, yeah. Not just, I have to do something with this screen in front Talk of me. Of yeah. Right. So kind of more the systems versus a device, right? An AAC system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Marcy, okay. thinking about that student that you talked about, that's, I, I love that story. So then in your head, where are you going next? I know. Mm -hmm. um, well, what was amazing is that the student is in high school now and has a phenomenal SLP. Um, who really is going to bat for him and has started doing uh, So two years ago, we were talking about moving from one switch to two switch mm -hmm. uh, discrimination tasks. And then because his hearing um, showed more, mm, he showed more of a preference for hearing than he did for using his vision. Kind of a relative strength. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and I think he, does have a CBI. Um, and, and to be clear, his CBI is still in phase one and it's still mm -hmm. kind of in, in the early stages. Mm -hmm. um, but we had, he is showing some success with the two switch auditory mm -hmm. um, step scanning, um, two switch discrimination, and then emerging into two switch step stepping. Mm -hmm. um, and I said to the SLP, you know, keep doing that, right? And giving her some of the next steps wow. for the two switch step scanning. But at the same time, I said to mom, why don't you come back in the summer um, and we'll play around a little bit more with the visual environment and the visual tools um, to see what, um, what might be um, an, uh, another avenue of learning for him. Right. Yeah. So um, baby uh, small methodical steps. Right. I won't even say baby steps, but like well thought out. Um, this is possibility. Let's see yeah. what we can do with this. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. That came from observation and and thinking, you know, critical thinking and um, not and, and knowing some of the questions to ask and things to look for. So you, you do have to do some some research. Right. You have to learn about. CBI, and then you have to be open to knowing you're always learning about it because you have every student is different, right? Yeah, like you said right at the beginning, I think it is so true. I, you know, after doing this for 30 years, I feel like every child who comes in um, is a new child, and I'm moving mm -hmm. with them, right? I'm pulling it all in and um, 
And then, you know, because you guys have been doing this for a long time too, like we amass our stories, right? And those stories stay with us um, mm -hmm. and, and really inform our, I mean, it's it's the third arm of our uh, evidence-based triangle, right? You know, it really informs our decision-making process to have those experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know. I can't tell you how many times I'll, I'll go in to do an evaluation and boom, they remind me of a different kid. And I go, and I think about the system that that kid had and why that worked. And it's one of my trials because I just, because that vision looked the same. Right. And then, then I think if you're, if you don't, if you don't have that, right. If you can't pull from the hundreds of AAC evaluations that you've done before, it's like, how do you, um, how do you determine like the trials and how you're doing all of that? And so some of this stuff is just like only with experience, can you um, add to more your experience? You know what I mean? <laughs> but um, not to say that if you're new in the field, um, you're not going to be good at this. It means, it means that um, every experience is you are learning and you trust me, if this is your foundation, you're going to keep building from it. You know, if, if you just heard about CVI, if you, if you're a new grad and you just, so you have one kid with CVI, learn everything you can because the next kid, you're going to feel that much better about going, Hey, I've seen this before. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the thing about doing this as long as you and I have. And with at the volume we have, it's like, there's not a lot we haven't seen in some way. Right. Uh, at the same time, they all bring a different set of skills, right? So there's their vision, there's their hearing, there's their body, there's their movement, there's tactile, there's all these kinds of things. And, and then, of course, there's personalities. <laughs> yeah, that's really true. You know, I think, um, I don't know about you, Brenda, but I know because Sarah and I are in Washington State, mm -hmm. um, uh, we both have the opportunity to do collaboration and consultation. Um, and it's something that... Um, I feel really strongly about if you are in a small district and you have that one-off kid uh, and you have that committed school team, um, it's just knowing what you don't know um, mm -hmm. and asking for a second set of eyes. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes that child will come down to Seattle Children's and then mm -hmm. um, I'll jump on to team meetings like quarterly um mm -hmm. to brainstorm ideas or I'll I'll get video clips um mm -hmm. from teams which I think is something that SCTC still does mm -hmm. yeah yeah we do yeah. it together actually okay yeah and so that's and we tell them to go see Marcy <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, you know whatever resources we're resources right? right like wherever you can um pull from the resources that you have it's so important to um just know that you um I don't want to say you know that you don't know it all, but um, mm -hmm. know what you don't know. know what right. You don't. right. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to ask you how other team members can be more involved in AAC evaluations because, you know, largely it's an SLP leading this, but it's really a team event, right? And uh, yeah, um, CBI and is just one piece of it too. So we know we need to think about TBIs and there's um, the, all of the, information that can come from an OT or a PT. But um, I'm glad you brought that up, that you will have team members come to your evaluation sometime from the school district, or you'll meet on Zoom. Um, do you have any other stories or examples of collaboration? Yeah, I, I, I do think in the old siloed model, um, don't we all get siloed because mm -hmm. of time and resources, mm -hmm. right? So you're in a school or you're in a clinic or you're in, you know, I'm in the hospital and it feels hard. Um, but um, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is um, if I don't do that, um, I don't get it right. Um, mm -hmm. I So to me, it, involving team members is essential, especially for yeah. um, motor and vision differences um, to get, information across people and environments um you know i have the parents come in but the school district personnel are welcome to come in like you said or zoom in um i want to know how they see in their classroom i want to know mm -hmm. how they see when they're in their wheelchair or sitting on the floor mm -hmm. um, i think uh, i mean i have a little bit of a bias um of the 
unbelievable importance of including the parents. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have, um, I have that um, beauty of having the parents with me in the evaluations. Mm -hmm. And then my challenge is always pulling in all the other team members from um, outside clinics and school districts. Right. Mm -hmm. But for school personnel, um, how do you pull in the parent? Um, I think, I think it's, it's just essential. And I do have some stories, but the first thing I'll start with is our AAC literature is so full of, of um, evidence on device abandonment, on the AAC system abandonment, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, I feel so strongly that families need to be included, um, that parents are why you're educating their children. Right. <laughs> uh, the children goes home every day after school and the family is their safety, it's their foundation. Um, I think the families are also the holders of information when their child moves schools or transitions to different right. teachers or therapists, right? Um, so if a school has decided on an AAC system, um, my suggestion, my strong, strong, please, please, please suggestion is to take an extra month and have that system uh, be a loaner system that goes home to the family, right? Did they set it up? Did they try to model on it? Do they like it? Do they not like it? Um, mm -hmm. What works for the family? Um, they're going to buy in more to it. They're going to invest. So I think into the assessment is is crucial. Um, and the story I have, well, I should tell you too, right? I should tell you kind of one that was blech and one that was good. <laughs> yes, yeah. let's hear both. Let's hear both sides of this. Um, one, the one that was kind of bleh was the this this child um, of a family who was limited in their um, resources with um, uh, like they didn't have phone or, or computers at home, those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And English was not their first language. This, the provider went ahead and bought a 15 inch uh, Toby system, or I think, um, mm -hmm. and the, team that evaluated this child hadn't considered that the family lives up a flight of stairs and that the 15 inch system was too big and too heavy. Um, they were already carrying like little baby sister up the stairs at, mm -hmm. at the time. So when I met the family, they said, we don't like this system. It's too big. It's too heavy. The wheelchair doesn't go up into the up into the home either, mm. so the child's not positioned properly. Um, and this pr was purchased through health insurance, which means that uh, at least here in Washington State, I can't, I can't, I, I can't, re we can't return it, uh, and I can't get them anything else. Um, and I think the mismatch there was if the system had gone home and if they had tried to work with the family, they would have they would have learned that um, that maybe not having the 15 inch system, maybe having the 13 inch or mm -hmm. um, getting a rolling floor mount because the wheelchair doesn't go up the stairs. Mm -hmm. Right. So kind of those are things that um, uh, are just really big reminders yeah. uh, as best as you can to have the team, have the team. Yeah. Um, but the successful one, um, was uh, I was able to see a boy who had cerebral palsy and cortical vision impairment um, and came in for an AAC evaluation. Uh, and it was really difficult to know where his vision was um, somewhere later phase one, early phase two on the CVI range. Um, definitely responded to screen. So the backlit screen and did he have a range when he came in? Kind of, um, he, he did not have okay. a range. Mm -hmm. He did not have a range. Um, I had the family try different systems over a few weeks and then they borrowed one. Uh, I think this was during the summer. This was during the summer. Um, in the school, when the school year started, um, I think the, the device went to school and then the school got to try it. 
And then um, I was able to connect with the team. You know, this is what we've learned so far. Ready, set, go. You know, you take it. You figure out what's going to work in the school setting. Um, and then, well, I mean, it's a pretty lengthy process, probably of about six months. But then we could say, yes, this is the system. This is the software. This is how we want it set up. Mm -hmm. um, because we took the time to work with the child at home and mm -hmm. then also to work with the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That. I think those are those are powerful stories for collaboration with families. And I think sometimes we hear um, like when we'll do consultation like that. Well, I don't think um, I don't know if the family's interested in AAC or, um, you know, they haven't been in the past, perhaps. And I think that's just a clue for us to dig deeper and and help get them more involved um, or or listen to them more. Right. <laughs> or has the only time it's ever been brought up at, you know, minute 97 of the IEP meeting, you know what I'm saying? Like, like, do they know the acronym? When did it get brought up? And is this an annual add on when you have to check was a was AT considered? Like, it's just hard to know when when a team says, I don't think the family's interested. It's like, I feel like the family is interested in the child communicating. Um, so how are we presenting the information? And like you're saying, it doesn't have to be a device. It can be a system. So even that, right? So it's like I, all of my evaluations, unless requested, um, unless the family requests that the, the evaluation is done at the school or the family requests it's done at the clinic, and even then the family is required to be there. So I don't do an evaluation without a family, without family. And I can't even imagine, I mean, doing that, not, not to... Um, doing an evaluation without the family, not not to judge the, the schools that are doing that because that's the way that goes. I can't imagine it because I have so much more information to make a better decision when I'm including the family. And I know what motivates the kid. The family has so much more. They're experts on their own children. So I love that you brought that collaboration piece up. And I feel like that's a systematic problem um, that that we have to like fight against. The, the system is setting us up to to work separate from families sometimes, and we have to we have to recognize that that's not best practice. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so true. Uh, you know, I love your um, the name of your podcast on wonder. Um, the word wonder for me is just the most fabulous word because um, if you have a perspective that maybe the family doesn't care, um, like stopping and pausing and wondering, wow. wondering what that is, right? Yeah. Because every family that walks through my door cares. Yeah. Who support. Never met one that didn't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, so true. I wonder. I wonder if. Yeah. Let's let's keep wondering. Let's stay curious. Let's keep, let's ask questions about that. Mm -hmm. For sure. Marcy, I think sometimes you have families who have come to you for an AC eval who don't have a CVI range, but the child does have CVI um, and they do know a lot about their child. But um, what kind of resources do you talk to them about? Finding good vision um, assessment evaluation, I think, is really hard in the medical model. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of going to an ophthalmologist or going to a, a local community optometrist mm -hmm. um, doesn't always give you the information that you want. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So one of the things that I do is recommend families seek out a behavioral optometrist um, because they're trained differently uh, and they're trained really in um, looking at the eyes uh, on how they're pro processing visual information. At the same time, they don't do what teachers of the vision impaired do. Um, it's unfortunate there's just like SLPs, there's just not enough right. teachers of the vision impaired out there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and then not everyone knows uh, about CVI. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And, and to the best of my knowledge, I don't know of anybody who you know, has a clinic, like a TVI, who is a medically based, uh, where, where right. families can go outside of the school. So let's say the right. school didn't give them the resources. Like, 
I don't even know where they would go outside of the school. But I do say, you know, start with the um, here in Washington State, we have several providers um, that we can refer to who are um, behavioral optometrists. And then um, always going back to the school and asking um, you know, who is the vision person. And if it's a smaller school district, um, um, telling families about the state resources that are available. And I think you guys okay. have somebody talking at the end of your series. Um, yes. Yes. That. Right. Ting, ting Su. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So many states will have support for vision at a state level. Um, so wherever you are, you can look for that. I have another resource too. Um, so like, see, we talked about the Bridge School and we talked about Perkins School. Mm -hmm. um, the other one that I go to um, all the time is the Texas School for the Blind and okay. their website because they have these amazing um, learning modules with video clips. Yes, uh, I have seen them. So if you're wondering about tactile sign language, if you're wanting about hand under hand prompting, mm -hmm. um, it, it, they show like these little video clips on on kind of how to encourage that that kind of uh, seeking out of hands. Um, yeah. And so they're another amazing resource. That's a great resource. Mercy, can you elaborate a little bit about the behavioral optometrist? I'm not sure I know that term. Yeah, um, I believe the website is the College of Vision Development or COVD dot org. So it's a specific kind of training um, that isn't just looking at the health of the eyes and looking at visual acuity. Those doctors who do um, those vision evaluations um, just provide more depth of information about vision versus, mm -hmm. uh, well, I measured this and I measured this and yep, they have an amblyopia or they have a nystagmus and you kind right. of go, ah, but, 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 but. <laughs> I right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And a little bit about what that can tell you. What does that mean in their, their everyday life, right? In their everyday life, in their functional everyday life. And mm -hmm. I think that those folks evaluate more um, toward that and then also um, like would give a written report toward that. You made me think of um, you made me think of cortical vision impairment um, and there's also another wonderful website um, uh, in the adult world. Uh, there is a group of people who support adults with um, ALS um, and uh, ALS is a neurodegenerative disorder that a lot of these folks go on to eye gaze. Um, yes. But because these folks often are still still speaking, they can report back mm. what affects their eye gaze system when they can see and when they're, they can't see and what's happening. So now we have wonderful, more detailed information of like um, my I, I'm on um, I'm on a certain medication and my eyes are drying out and dry eyes is like the devil of eye gaze <laughs> right um, or um, uh, if you have any medical any sort of medical things that you're wearing like uh, oxygen masks mm -hmm. um, th those can interfere with the cameras yeah um, even NG tubes yeah mm -hmm, yeah um, or if there's a, a, a window behind you or a mirror mm -hmm. behind you, um, mm -hmm. yeah, for the reflection. And so um, I think it's a little bit of a tangent from what you asked, but like just pulling in all that details yeah. of how you're using your vision to interact with an AAC system, but yet you have to consider all of these variables. Uh, yeah, It's great that sure. there's that firsthand experience, that lived experience that we can here about uh, bridging voice bridging voice dot org. Okay, great. Yeah. There it is. Thank you. Well, we are nearing the end of our time already. That felt so fast. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to talk about, Mercy? 
I'm I'm wondering about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, we're in it, awe of you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a journey, isn't it? Right. Um, I think summarizing um, is if you have a student that you're working with who you're thinking AAC and you're thinking uh, uh, vision and there's some vision differences. So you're mm-hmm. thinking about that is, you know, kind of these, these big truths, right? Um, pull in all your team members, mm-hmm. take it slow, observe the like, dynamic assessment, mm-hmm. um, trials, Um, trials in different settings with different people, Mm -hmm. um, making sure you're thinking about the environment, the time of day, the positioning. Um, Yeah, all of that. That's a great little wrap up though. That's, there's a lot to consider. We really appreciate you. We appreciate your expertise. We, we appreciate the feedback we hear from families that have been evaluated by you. So we have a lot of respect for you. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. And I am so excited to hear the whole series. Yeah. 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 We have learned a lot. We have learned from every single guest. And not, not to say that we don't do that in every series because mm-hmm. um, we, we're just the average people. So we ask the questions that the average listeners I'm wanting to know about. But we still, we learn. We, I mean, th- that this is the thing about this podcast is like, we don't get to sit around. We, we are still in silos. And we, we don't get to sit around and talk to other people that have a lot of more experience about about something that we want to know about, you know. And so we, it's such um, a privilege to be able to have a platform where we can get get everyone's experience. And it just all comes together like a puzzle. Like, I love this piece and I love this piece. And now this picture is more clear. So yeah. thank you for your con- contribution to the puzzle today. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. The contents of this podcast were developed under contract with the Washington Office of the Superintendent of Public Instruction, U.S. Department of Education, and administered by Central Washington University. However, those contents did not necessarily represent the policy of the OSPI and CWU, and you should not assume endorsement by the federal and state government.